Things are changing so rapidly, and there's so much still that's unknown that we don't know what the situation is going to be two weeks from now. We don't know what the situation is going to be one week from now. Some individuals are symptomatic and others are not, and so it has had a bit of a fear of the unknown. Um, that has been complicated by how quickly it has moved uh, really around the world and certainly within the United States and uh, within the Atlanta area. So um, that has been unsettling for all of us. Welcome to Science Gallery Atlanta. My name is Dr. Deborah Watkins Bruner, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Research at Emory University. In the next hour, you will hear from Emory University's faculty, staff, and healthcare providers who are working on various dimensions of grief in these extraordinary times. Through their research to find a cure, their selfless care for those with this virulent coronavirus, or through their art that gives voice to grief. Welcome to Science Gallery Atlanta. I'm Kevin Carnes, Professor of Music and Vice Provost for the Arts at Emory University. Our first guest in Emory's segment of this program is a veteran of infectious disease research. Dr. Anish Mehta was part of the Emory team that successfully treated patients with Ebola virus disease some years ago. Hello, Anish, and thank you for speaking with us. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. My name is Anish Mehta. I'm an infectious disease physician at Emory University Hospital. I'm also a member of the Emory Sears Communicable Diseases team. And I am the lead investigator for Emory University for the NIH Adaptive COVID Trials of Therapeutics, uh, which has recently completed a comparison of remdesivir versus placebo for the care of COVID-19 patients. In terms of what we know and what we don't know, and there's a lot that we don't know. What do you think are the key gaps in knowledge right now, especially around transmission and treatment? I think transmission is a really key focus for us to understand. Uh, we really need to know where transmission is occurring, in what context, what settings, um, and importantly, how much of asymptomatic or, or Patient or people with very mild symptoms, how much are they spreading compared to others? And I think our knowledge is growing greatly in, in the transmission dynamics, the context in which spread occurs, but I think we still have a, a long way to go. And unfortunately, we would usually use things like contact tracing and some of these classic epidemiologic techniques to find this information out. But this outbreak spread so rapidly and, and sort of overwhelm some of our ability to collect these data. And so I think we're still catching up from that process to, to really understand transmission. And the other area that, other areas that I think are key for our research to contribute to are really, how do we take care of these patients and are there any therapies, any medicines, or what we call medical countermeasures that may impact their care? One of the observations of COVID-19 patients by clinicians is the seemingly sudden collapse of a patient who until then shows no sign of being critical. Have you seen that? And what are some of the theories around why that's happening? One of the things is just the dramatic amount of inflammation that is induced by this infection in certain people. Um, and we can see that infection sort of overwhelm the body and really cause tissue damage and, and other side effects from just the dramatic inflammation. 
We've also found that this virus, probably due to the inflammation that it induces, is causing clots, blood clots in people. And sometimes they're small clots, sometimes they're large clots. But I can think of uh, very specific instances where patients were seemingly stable, but developed a massive blood clot that went to their lungs and suddenly the patient was dramatically ill and had to be on a ventilator. And, and some of these patients died. And so it is, it is quite shocking uh, when you see that. And I think as we learn more, hopefully we'll have better ways of predicting it. But now we have, because we understand that some of these reasons, we're really trying to address that inflammation and we're trying to address uh, clotting of the blood so that we prevent some of these more dramatic outcomes. Since we're in the midst of it, it's hard to sometimes take a step back and see the good. What do you think is the silver lining in this? And what are some of the lessons learned? It's just the way that the global community, particularly the uh, healthcare community, came together and started to spread information, collaborate together to understand what was going on with patients and, and how we could help patients and we could help our community. I think that has just been heartwarming to be part of. Um, and I think for me as an individual clinician, the great silver lining is that while there are patients who are sick and unfortunately a few that pass away, um, which is obviously quite um, dramatic and sad, we have so many patients going home and now I get to see them back in clinic and get to see that they're getting to be with their children or their grandchildren now. They're walking. A few of them just went back to work this week and they're you know, uh, back to the lives that they want to live. And I think that is just a wonderful thing to be part of, knowing that all the work that we have all been doing together is really contributing to getting people back home and getting them back to the life they want to live. We've heard several stories from so many frontline healthcare providers on this pandemic. Having dealt with Ebola especially, which was a huge milestone in terms of emerging infectious diseases and care, what do you think has been the most challenging aspect for you? So starting with professionally, you know, we are seeing these patients every day. And, um, and usually we have a very collaborative relationship with the patient and their family. But in this setting, the patients are isolated from their family. And that's quite tough to watch your patient not being able to be there with their loved ones because you really want that support to be part of their medical care. And, it, and we do have technologies that allow them to talk to them, but it's not quite the same as having your spouse or your parent or your child in the room with you to give you that support. And that's hard to watch for, for our patients for sure. And, and clearly the patients that we have lost are, are quite difficult. Um, I think we are, um, we do have patients that pass away from infectious disease, but usually we um, know what we're treating and we have things to treat them with along with the great clinical care. And we have um, not seen this amount of mortality in a communicable disease in a while. Would you feel comfortable sharing a story that in your mind illuminates the science of grief from a healthcare perspective? There was one case that I think has really sort of affected me um, in, it, it is in a, you know, sort of a, a heartbreaking yet beautiful uh, way. Um, so there was a patient and uh, this is, you know, a very, an elderly gentleman, but very high functioning, runs a business, very intelligent. And uh, we talked about the study, wanted to think about it. He talked it over with his granddaughter and, and I talked it over with his granddaughter. And, you know, we all came together and decided finally that um, this was the right study for him and he agreed to be in it. And so we gave him one dose of the medicine and then he did fine. And then suddenly the next day he got very ill very quickly. And again, quickly transferred to the ICU. Um, and unfortunately, even before we can give him the second dose of the medicine, he had a cardiac arrest. And the ICU team fought valiantly for him for hours to try to revive him, bring his heart back. Um, but it became very clear that he was not going to survive. And so um, he had this wonderful grand, he has this wonderful granddaughter who um, has been his uh, medical caretaker. Um, and, and so we all very well understood what was going to happen. 
And he had this wonderful nurse, Alex, who stayed in the room with him, keep him comfortable during the dying process, but also had his cell phone, the patient's cell phone, charged and, and so his granddaughter could talk to him. We witnessed, all of us, um, this wonderful granddaughter talking to her grandfather as he was dying and just saying wonderful things to him, telling him stories about their life together. And again, it was beautiful yet heartbreaking. Um, it just shows that what we do scientifically has, and medically has a dramatic impact, but also what we do in our communities and the family that we live with and the family that cares for us is so much more important. And while she couldn't be in the room, we found a way for her to be able to talk to him during that process. And that was really meaningful, that just little bit of being able to hold that cell phone and, and his nurse just staying there for all that time, just holding that cell phone to his ear so his granddaughter could talk to him was, was really meaningful and will stick with me for a long time. fourth year medical student at Emory School of Medicine, about to graduate in a little less than a week. Um, I'll be doing emergency medicine residency. I'll be starting my first year of residency at the um, University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. Super excited about that. So I'll be heading to Miami, Florida in a couple weeks. So uh, a little bit of background as to why I wrote this poem. Um, it was actually an assignment for a literature and medicine class that I took back in March. And towards the end of the class, as we were getting ready to kind of wrap up our final papers and submit everything, our professor asked us if, in addition to our final paper, if we could just write a short reflection on the COVID-19 outbreak, since that was something that we were all kind of living through and adjusting to at that moment. So this poem was born out of that. Um, I do love to write. That's something that I've always enjoyed doing even as a kid. So whether it's poetry, essays, short stories, plays, all of that, um, words have always been very important to me. I love to read, I love to write. Um, I just think that words have a lot of power and a lot of magic in them. Also, as someone who's going into emergency medicine, you know, that's a field that's very much built on service and advocacy and I picked it because I wanted to work on the front lines of healthcare. So for me, it's kind of like, I wish I could be there to help, but then also realizing that I am very much in my early stages of medical training. So then there's the question of how much help would I would I really be? Would I even if I could be in the hospital right now, would I be more in the way? And then thinking about going into residency, which is going to start in a couple months, um, that imposter syndrome too. That that idea of okay, well now here's my chance to step up and serve, but Am I equipped for the task? Am I am I ready? Will I be in the way instead of being useful when I'm on when I'm actually there trying to to help? So I think all of those feelings kind of ended up in this poem. And for me, I think art really informs medicine. Um, I think that the ability to process your emotions makes you more empathetic and it makes you more ethical too, right? A lot of the feelings that I described weren't necessarily feelings that I'm proud of, um, but they were feelings that I had to work through. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge all of those feelings because if you don't acknowledge them, then you just kind of repress them and then that eats away at you and is counterproductive. But I concluded with this idea that to be human is to suffer. It's to experience all of these feelings, good and bad, to have, you know, lived through something like a pandemic that is part of what it means to be human. But to be human is also to create. And I think holding on to that will help us heal as we work through this challenging new experience together. So now I'd like to share this poem with you. The poem is entitled Hubris. <clears throat> Hubris. I'm on the cusp of something so important, yet I'm relegated to the sidelines. Medical students were banned from hospital rotations, although the school held out until the very end. Students are like 
dutiful postal workers. For neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. We always show up at the hospital. That is, until they run out of PPE. And remember that we're non-essential workers who are always in the way, yet trying ever so hard to be useful. I know it's not about me, and I'm all too happy to surrender a mask to a clinician or staff member who needs it to do their hero's work. I don't care about missed match days and doctoral hooding ceremonies. How could I? when so many are suffering. In fact, I'm proud of the ways that my classmates have banded together to do our duty remotely and provide hope and relief to our wearied leaders. But a small part of me, the part that can't wait to shove my short white coat into the back of my closet and embrace the title of emergency room doctor in early June. Wishes that I too could answer the call to arms and join my colleagues in this worldwide virologic battle. At the moment, I feel useless and far removed as I zoom into classes and scroll through viewing options on Netflix. Totally isolated from the war zone that's not five miles from my apartment. Healthcare providers are on the front lines of this crisis, caring for others with COVID in a time of great uncertainty. We have one of those heroes with us today, registered nurse Josiah Mamora. Welcome. Hi, I'm Josiah Mamora. I'm a nurse clinician here at Emory Healthcare. Um, I'm also one of the lead uh, nurses for the Serious Communicable Disease Unit, otherwise known as the Ebola Unit. You have been on the front lines of two of the most deadly viruses of our generation, both Ebola and COVID. Can you compare and contrast? How is COVID different? COVID is different in that it's an actual global pandemic. Um, uh, Ebola was more of like a, a, a regional pandemic or multiple countries, um, a lot of patients, um, but it was pretty much sequestered into a small region of, of, of the globe still a large region landmass wise but specifically sequestered in, in you know in, in just one continent and then we had our of course we had our small um, hospital outbreak here of, of two patients two patients who were, who were healthcare workers in the states um, but most of our patients were uh, repatriated folks uh, from uh, West Africa or workers uh, healthcare workers from West Africa uh, COVID is more of a global pandemic in that where you get COVID and how you how you've gotten COVID, in the in the epidemiological sense, it's it's hard to ascertain at this point. Um, we we all know it's from you know the or, origination is from Wuhan, China, but um, as for healthcare workers here, if they get it, where did they get it from? The patient, the community. So Josiah, in the middle of all that you've been dealing with. We understand that your mother was infected with COVID and she yeah. lives in a different state. I, I can't even imagine what you must have gone through. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a little weird. Um, having kind of experienced being on the other side of, um, of the healthcare system, you know, like being a, not, well, not, not necessarily a patient, but having a patient or a loved one in, in the hospital. Um, being that it's my mother and she was progressively getting sick um, and working in the COVID units myself it's like I know the isolation that can happen for our patients you know, you know um, I 
every part of me wanted to go to California, get the next plane ticket down and try to visit her. But I mean, knowing that the standardization of, of protocols throughout the nation about, you know, pretty much no visitors within the COVID areas. Um, and then knowing as well that my family who are not in the hospital are probably as well COVID positive because they all live in the same um, house. Uh, it, it, it's a weird feeling to where it's like, you, you wanna be there for your family and your loved ones, but you really aren't allowed to visit and you know the reasons why you can't visit because you're a healthcare worker. Um, you know, thankfully it's, you know, 2020 and we have enough technology to be able to um, visit our loved ones virtually. But again, it's not the same. It really isn't the same. It really feels very isolating for patients. And, you know, I, I've, I've talked to my mother and she said the same thing. It's very isolating. Um, and I think the hardest part for, especially, you know, thankfully it didn't happen to my family specifically, but my mother experienced a certain level of survivor's guilt because she had friends as well in, you know, I'm part of their church community that did get sick as well. And they didn't pull through. And by the time my mother was coherent enough to kind of understand all this, she, it, it, it was hard. And, and, you know, like I, I wanted to be there to give my mother a hug and comfort her. But again, it's in this kind of time period, it's just not, not a possible thing to do. Um, physically just because, you know, we're, we're trying to socially distance ourselves and keep ourselves protected. So you said you would love to have hugged your mom and I hear you're a hand holder as a good nurse should be. And that it's been very difficult for you not being able to be with the patient at all times that you've done some novel things like uh, put baby monitors on the other side of the room. So you can communicate. Uh, yeah. So how does that work? Yeah, we've implemented baby monitors uh, through most of our COVID um, uh, ICUs and uh, rooms. Uh, it's just pretty much like a communication device, how you would use it for a baby. You know, you hear them uh, say something, you hear, you hear a cry, you hear a moan, you immediately say, hey, is everything okay? Uh, what's, what's going on? Again, that immediate uh, feedback, I think, is important for our patients to feel less isolated, uh, where beforehand, if the patient needs something, even on a regular room, it's like they, they click a button and then a, a call light goes on, a, a bell goes on, and there's a delay before anyone can even get to the room. So nurses every day have to worry about all of the technical aspects of keeping themselves protected and of caring for their patients. And yet you are describing one of the most fundamental principles of being a nurse, and that's the human side and caring of nursing your advocacy, you are heroes, but that must take a toll on you, Josiah. Standing at a patient's bed, helping them communicate when you know that this may be their last words to their family, how do you deal with that? Um, it's, it's very difficult and it's, it's very fatiguing, um, especially for the first two weeks. I, pretty much, I was pretty much working um, every day and, and throughout the night, it, I was probably violating uh, <laughs> my, my our, our restrictions, but you know, it's like you just have this obligation. Again, I have an internal obligation to do as much as I can, um, but also not, not as, as, as well for my coworkers, who have, since I do a lot of the PPE training and everything else, uh, when they have questions, I try to answer those questions immediately so that they feel, my coworkers, my colleagues, they feel supported. Um, and honestly, I don't have a good way, or I don't have a good method to say, you know, like how, how to cope. The only way I, I do cope with the fatigue is I exercise. Especially with COVID, it's hard to leave work at work because it's, you're just inundated by COVID on media. Even when you come home, um, there's, you know, you're worried about COVID and we're at work, it's COVID, it's just COVID everywhere and it's very fatiguing. So I think 
just cutting out time for yourself to just check out out of the news cycle and out of the, you know your work regimen at least for a little bit of time. Uh, hopefully, everyone realizes how how interlinked everyone else's occupations and lives are. And I think hopefully, well, hopefully we'll all have like a, a bigger community, like a, a, a more, uh, not so much as like a national community, but like, like a global community or global sense that like, hey, we're all, we're all linked together and we really are all just like separated by six degrees, if not less. I mean, you know, <laughs> it used to be six degrees of, you know, uh, separation or, you know, there was another term, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. How many people, you know, you know, <laughs> uh, are separated from you and Kevin Bacon? But I think with with COVID, it's like you know, we've all been touched by COVID, either either by the disease or by the economic factors, or even by the life changes that we've we've had to make. And I think hopefully at the end of this, you know, we we realize that we're all connected and that we can all kind of move together as. Uh, a single entity, like a, a single humanity, a single species, and a single kind of understanding that we're all, we really are all in this together. Um, and you know, that's ironically, Emory Healthcare is a, <laughs> a, a mantra <laughs> that we're all in this together. <laughs> well, there could not be better closing words, Josiah. We are so thankful for your service and please stay safe. Will do, thank you so much. Dr. Nadine Kaslow is Professor and Vice Chair of Psychology and Behavior Services at Emory University School of Medicine. Nadine is the Chief Psychologist of Grady Health System and a former President of the American Psychological Association. A few weeks ago, Nadine joined Emory audiences on Facebook Live to answer questions about how to stay focused and positive during the pandemic. Nadine, you're helping provide mental health care to our frontline health care workers, and you're also an expert on how mass events impact all of us. Can you share with us the reality from some of the briefings that you've had with our health care workers? Sure. So I've been spending a lot of time with colleagues uh, doing deep briefings with groups of people, nurses, techs, uh, physicians, respiratory therapists, uh, and the like who are really on the front lines right now and providing an opportunity for them to talk about how they're feeling, how they're doing, what they're concerned about, their stresses, both at work and at home, talking about some effective ways to sort of bolster their resilience during this time, some tips for coping, and, and really helping people reflect on what they're grateful about right now and having gratitude about. People are incredibly stressed out. They are worried about getting COVID-19 themselves, getting infected themselves, infecting other people, their families. It's very sad and difficult to see how ill patients are, how sick people are, people dying from the virus. Uh, there's not enough protective equipment to go around, which everybody's been hearing about. Everyone's grateful to the community for all the ways they've stepped up for healthcare workers, and that's one of the things people are most grateful for, but people are scared and they're panicking and they're angry at sort of systems not able to take care of them as much as they need to be taken care of. And they're tired. Some people are separated from their families right now because they want to be sure their family is safe or their family's not comfortable with them. And that's added stress as well. What can families of healthcare workers and the rest of us in general do to show support to those workers? Well, I think people have done a tremendous job of offering uh, resources. So many healthcare workers have talked about things like neighbors or their religious community, leaving them food, writing them thank you notes, sending them texts to check in, um, expressing gratitude. I know in some places at a certain time of the day, everybody's going outside and thanking the healthcare workers. And that means a lot to people, providing protective equipment to, to people and masks and things like that really helps. But I think that what many healthcare workers really need people to do is listen to them, is listen to their stress, listen to their strain, be supportive to them, be compassionate and kind toward them. And 
and thank them, but also listen to them as they talk about their struggles. A lot of people are stress eating and drinking right now. How can we manage our stress? Can we actually use our diet for good to manage the stress? So I'm glad you raised the issue about drinking because that's absolutely, alcohol and drug misuse, again, in the extreme would be other indicators that people are really struggling and, and <coughs> may need to seek help. Whereas some people are doing things like having virtual happy hours and enjoying those and maybe doing that a little more regularly than normal. And that to me seems like a reasonable way to cope. Same thing with the eating. Again, a little bit of stress eating, that's within the normal range right now. If somebody starts gaining 20, 30 plus pounds through this, that would really worry me. But if a lot of people gain, you know, a few pounds, I think that's quite understandable. But to me, sometimes stress eating is comforting. I, I don't think it's the time to really try to limit yourself too much unless it's really out of control. But I do think that it needs to be balanced with exercise. How do I deal with feeling helpless and powerless right now? So feeling helpless and powerless is, again, just like the anxiety, very understandable reaction. I think what's useful to do is differentiate what you can control and how you can control that and do everything that you can and then what you can't control and us all get to a place, <coughs> excuse me, of being more accepting of that. And so I think that when you feel helpless, sort of stop and say, what is there that I can control? What am I doing to maximize my coping and problem solving related to that? And then what is it that I simply, unfortunately, cannot control? And how do I come to some kind of peace with that, some acceptance? And also sort of ponder larger, more existential questions related to that when you don't feel in control. Nadine, thank you for covering so many topics and areas of concern for us. If you or someone you know is in need of emotional support at this time, here are some contacts for people who can help. Please reach out. Hi, I'm Heather Crystal. I'm an assistant professor of creative writing at Emory University, and I'm going to be reading from my latest book, which is called The Crying Book. Uh, it's my first work of nonfiction. I'm usually a poet, and it came about after many, many years of researching crying. There's a lot of quoted material in the book, uh, words from other people's minds and pages, so when I'm reading those moments, I'll just indicate that by lifting my hand, and you'll know that I am quoting something else. Uh, I also mention many of my friends in this book who are poets and artists and writers, and I call them by their first names, which I do in real life. Uh, so don't worry about not knowing who they are. Crying won't make you feel better. We only think that it will, or perhaps more important, think that at some point in the past it did. Let it out, we hear some imaginary figure instruct, and tearfully we obey. But when subjects report their mood immediately after a crying episode, it's often worse than before. Then again, this may be because the subjects are crying in a laboratory, the tears are meant to solicit aid, and the researchers provide little comfort to those whose tears they've provoked. Rachel disagrees, says crying for her provides a great release. She also says the half moon looks like a taco, which makes me trust her capacity for both truth and joy. It's June, and Chris and I are supposed to go teach at a writer's institute in Massachusetts, but the baby, now a full year old, has a terrible ear infection, and I have to stay home with her in Ohio. Chris goes alone. I cry at the loss of precious time with dear friends, at the chance to be someone and something other than mother. Chris is supposed to give a reading with Jim, our old teacher, our beloved poet, husband to Dara, a parent to Emily and Guy. Chris comes home. Jim dies. I turn, as one does, to his poems. You cannot weep. I cannot do anything that once held an ounce of meaning for us. I cover you with pine needles. When morning comes, I will build a cathedral around our bodies. And the crickets, who sing with their knees, will come there in the night to be sad, when they can sing no more. 
Emily and I exchange techniques to stop crying. There comes a time, we say, when one is simply not in the mood. Pick a color, she tells me, and find every instance of it in the room. I pick blue. I pick dark green. One day, I call her and say that if I start to cry, I want her to squawk like a chicken. When my voice starts to shake, she panics and quacks like a duck. Then I am laughing and crying all at once, wet and loud and thankful, and it feels as if my heart has turned itself inside out. There are other ways to stop. One day, reading Joan Didion, I learn a new method. It was once suggested to me that, as an antidote to crying, I put my head in a paper bag. As it happens, there is a sound physiological reason, something to do with oxygen, for doing exactly that, but the psychological effect alone is incalculable. It is difficult, in the extreme, to continue fancying oneself Kathy in Wuthering Heights with one's head in a food fair bag. Among WikiHow's How to Stop Yourself from Crying, my favorite step is Remove the Lump from Your Throat, a surgery by active will. I imagine it falling into my hand like a doll's pacifier. If you cannot stop your tears, or if you must take your cried-out face into public, you can hide behind a lie about allergies or a cold. You could, like Roland Barth, don dark sunglasses. The intention of this gesture is a calculated one. I want to keep the moral advantage of stoicism, of dignity, and at the same time, contradictorily, I want to provoke the tender question, but what's the matter with you? I fear the tender question, whose ever-elusive answer will only stimulate more tears. The hiding is a way to stop other people from trying to help, a way to not have to explain precisely how and why I cannot be helped. I'd like to hang a little sign on each lens, out of order. When Gabrielle sends me a passage from Michelle T's novel, Black Wave, she is trying to help me with my writing, not with my crying, but I find ideas in it to try out in my own life. She kept tablespoons in the freezer, would place their rounded bottoms on her eyelids. She kept chamomile tea bags soaking in the fridge. She kept cucumbers handy and would layer her face in slices. At a beauty store, she selected a product with raspberry extract that promised to reduce eye puffiness. In the novel, Michelle does not find the people's suggestion to use Preparation H on puffy eyes useful, but I buy some anyway. The ointment form is too greasy, but the cream seems to help. I love the way people offer these remedies to one another, the care of tending, the way they try to offer an answer to a problem without lobbying a query of their own. People want to know, can the phoenix's tears bring someone back to life? They go to Yahoo Answers, and everyone weighs in. No, they can only heal wounds. They would not even heal a dead person's wounds, for the tears only make the skin heal faster, and dead skin does not heal, and even if it did heal, the tears cannot bring them back to life by shocking their heart back into motion. Reading this is like riding a water slide of tears. I go down it again and again. There is no phoenix and no phoenix tears, and nothing can bring back the dead. But these words, these hopes, and these breathless responses, they can shock a heart back into motion. I have felt it, have felt myself alive. Hi, I'm Dr. Evan Anderson, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine at Emory University. I'm the uh, Principal Investigator at Emory University of the uh, mRNA vaccine that is being developed for uh, COVID-19 response. One of the things I've heard is that there's been a huge response in terms of people calling and wanting to be on the trial. Is that unusual? What does that tell you about the hunger for this? Uh, we have had a very um, significant response with a lot of people expressing interest and potentially volunteering for uh, the study. The initial screening uh, visit is usually an hour and a half, sometimes two hours uh, in length, um, and, and very critical as far as trying to make sure that we're really identifying 
um, people who are otherwise very healthy without a lot of other medical comorbidities, which might complicate um, our assessment of the safety and the immune response to the vaccine. In the age group, is anyone over 18? Yeah, so the study initially started as being 18 to 55, but then has been expanded up uh, with no upper limit from the age standpoint. Uh, and so uh, it's enrolling all adults now. How optimistic can we be about this vaccine? We, we all want to quickly develop a vaccine and to, um, to have one available so that we can uh, move back towards our old normal um, situation uh, in which we're walking around without masks and going to work and interacting with our families and our friends without fear. Um, uh, obviously, we'd like to get back to that point again. Uh, the simple reality is that most vaccines that start out in phase one clinical trials do not make it all the way to vaccine licensure. In fact, it's the minority of uh, vaccines that do make it. Um, certainly, we're cautiously optimistic um, about uh, this vaccine. Uh, so far, as uh, Tony Fauci has said, there are no red flags um, associated with the vaccine to date, um, although the safety continues to be monitored. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to move on to the phase two study um, over the next months. How many phases are there typically in a vaccine trial? So there are typically three phases um, to uh, to vaccine development similar to uh, drug development. So we are in phase one. There's a larger phase two study that then would be conducted, typically enrolling uh, hundreds of people. Uh, and then ultimately the key study will be the phase three study um, or phase three studies that need to be done that look at the actual ability of the vaccine to prevent COVID-19 disease, and as well ensuring safety in a large number of individuals, typically in the thousands, uh, is required for the phase three studies. So we have a ways to go um, towards, uh, towards getting the vaccine license, but everyone is doing all that they can to expedite the process as much as we safely can. You've probably met some of the enrollees in this vaccine's trial. Tell us a little bit about what their thoughts are and what they're telling you in terms of hope, despair, and aspiration. Everyone wants to be involved with helping in some form or fashion. I think it's an important human characteristic that we have. Um, so you have people making masks at home, you have people uh, um, making signs for healthcare workers, um, you have the healthcare workers that are going in and taking risk upon themselves to try and benefit their fellow man on a daily basis. Uh, part of my job right now is trying to move forward this vaccine as quickly as we safely can. Um, and uh, that's my specific role. Uh, many of the vaccinees are actually thrilled to have the opportunity to, um, to uh, contribute to the effort to respond to COVID-19. And there may or may not be any benefit. There's even theoretical harm associated with the vaccine, but they want to do something to help uh, with the COVID-19 response. And so in many ways, they're really heroes and very admirable people that are willing to you know, take some unspecified risk upon themselves to try and benefit the whole of uh, the society. And so, um, We've, we're very, very fortunate for the volunteers that we uh, have had in the past and the ones that we currently have. Our next healthcare hero is a registered nurse, Letha Love. Letha, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you work and where you are now? My name is Letha Love, like you stated. Um, I work at Emory, Healthcare at um, Winship C, and that's the uh, Cancer Institute at the main campus. Um, right now, I'm in Manhattan, New York. Um, 
with the COVID-19 pandemic. Lisa, you made an incredible sacrifice. You have a family member to take care of your children so that you could go from Atlanta to the epicenter New York. What compelled you to do that? The decision was based on prayer and if I needed to be up here or at home. Being at home, I know it was a chance of me exposing my kids. So I decided to come here and I, I can't expose them from here. Are you with a group of nurses that have come from other places and they're, they're giving you lodging? Oh yes, definitely. It's, it's um, over a thousand nurses. And I can't PAs. imagine how close you've become. Uh, you've made new bonds that are, even for nurses, uh, stronger and more amazing than, than what we usually face in, in work. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, of course, you have to make bonds with people up here. Um, you don't have any family here. Uh, it's so emotional up here. You have to have some shoulder to cry on. If not, you would lose it. You would definitely not make it in this environment if you didn't make bonds with people that you don't know. Just so happened, um, I came up with a friend of mine that I've been friends with for over seven years, but she and I are on different shifts, so I never get to see her. Um, the ladies that I've met in the employee health, it has been kind of my rock right now because they definitely listen to we listen to each other in the struggle of what we're going through because none of us want to get sick. You know, and speaking of that struggle as a former ICU nurse, I know that you are used to critically ill, dying patients. What is different about this, Letha? Um, the difference is when we are in ICU on a regular basis, it's just, I see you, you have your two patients, they may be critical, but the probability of you, them dying so all of a sudden, or you coming to work the next night, you will have those same two patients. Um, up here in the ICU, take a moment, Lisa, take all the time you need. Yeah, up here, you, you might have the same patients not one day or two days and then they're gone um I, i've never been in a hospital and i've also worked at grady and i know you know what grady how grady is i've never heard so many colds in one night um seven and eight different colds and not only just ICU all over the hospital in the ER on med surge um I mean just colds all night every 30 minutes almost I just never experienced that and it's it's beyond what you would ever experience as a nurse so how are you coping with that? What is it you do to get through this, Letha? Um, I pray. Um, I talk to my friend. Um, I call my kids. Uh, and, and I rely on people praying for me and, and, and giving me support just to make it through the next day, honestly. It's good to know that there are ways for, that you to cope for this with this grief. But is there anything you would like to say to those watching? How how can how can we help? Right now, we just need support. Uh, if any nurses want to come up here and help out, or, or PAs or um, MPs or what have you, you know, the space is still here. Um, as far as a community, I think the biggest thing for help would be to please stay at home because I'm. I'm gonna have to leave New York and come home to the same thing. And that's a lot. That's a lot. It's a lot to know that I may have to leave New York and come work in Georgia under the same environment. And it's a lot just because now that weighs on my mind. And that's my question to people. Is your appearance more important than your life? Letha, we're very grateful for your time. Our thoughts and our prayers are with you.
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. One of Emory University's premier infectious disease experts, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, joined an Emory-hosted Facebook Live gathering a couple weeks ago to provide an update on the clinical and public health impact of the new coronavirus. Carlos, what are some factors for higher mortality rates in our community? We're looking at that. We're studying that. Uh, I think several possibilities. Number one is health disparities. Uh, number two is, is higher, uh, higher prevalence of uh, of diabetes and hypertension. Remember, we're in the bi we're the diabetes belt, right? A lot of diabetes in our, in our population. So diabetes, hypertension, obesity may be more prevalent, which drives mortality. So again, this is this is the the, the sort of the, the the clashing of diabetes, hypertension with an infectious disease is, is is being lived right now in our in our community. How does wearing masks help slow the spread? One of the things we've learned, and we're pretty certain now is not only that there's asymptomatic or presymptomatic transmission. We now know from a recent study that about two to three days before you develop symptoms, you are highly infectious. And in fact, some of the studies suggest that maybe up to 40 to 50% of transmissions occur during those two days before you develop symptoms. So you may be sitting here and feeling fine, but you're already transmitting. So the idea of having people wear a mask is so if you happen to be in that stage by wearing a mask, you then don't transmit to others because your, your saliva and your secretions stay within the mask and they're not then shared with others. So by doing that, we can probably decrease asymptomatic transmission a significant amount. Now, the one important thing is that then you have to wash this mask because obviously the inside is gonna be contaminated if you cough or you sneeze into it. And I would suggest that you know you, you treat this mask with a lot of care so you don't, you don't uh, infect others in your household. Do we ever go back to where we were? We may need to wear a mask for a long period of time. We may need to see who's infected and who hasn't. We may need to think about, you know, there may be antivirals being developed in the meantime. So we may go back to a, a normal in which you're diagnosed and you start an anti, antiviral right away. So I think things will change. I don't think we're gonna be in this position until 2022, like the study suggests, but clearly we're not gonna be back to where we were uh, only a few months ago. I think it's going to take some time to get there. But my challenge to everybody in the U.S. and my challenge to, to, to the president, to everybody, is I don't want to get, go back to where we were. I want to go forward to a better America. I want to go forward to a better place. I think we learned in this epidemic a significant impact in African Americans. I think we learned the impact of health disparities. We've seen health disparities in this country for a long, long time. Maybe it's time that we use COVID to address health disparities and actually we go to a better place. We get to a better America, much that is a, an America that is more equal, an America that gives better opportunities to people and that really works together in trying to control an, an infectious disease like this one. Do you feel a sense of heaviness? Uh, yes, you do. You feel the heaviness, you feel the uncertainty, you feel, the, you feel powerless, right? And I think what, what we hate in our lives and when we have no control and the lack of control is something that as humans is, is very disturbing. And, and, and you wish you could do more, but you can't. And you're trying to do the best and, and not, not always the best is, is the right thing. And you make mistakes and you, you wish you could you know, get on a plane and go uh, visit your kids and your family and, and you can't. What are some of the good things that you're seeing? Well, the glimmers are hope is that Number one, we are seeing benefits of social distancing and we're seeing real benefits. More hospitalizations are, are less than expected in many cities and mortality is coming down. I mean, in the country, if we hadn't done the things we were doing, we would have seen 1.8 to 2.2 million deaths. We're going to see 60 to 80,000 deaths. That is a huge difference. I mean, still 60 to 80,000 is a lot of deaths, but it's a lot less than 1.8 to 2.2 million. Number two, we're seeing people do things that we never thought it was possible, right? 90 plus percent of the country is, is doing social distancing and it's actually doing it without any police force like they did it in China. There's nobody, the police is not out there enforcing it and people are doing the right thing. And I think that shows what citizenship is like. We're seeing enormous, enormous acts of kindness. I mean, I'm, a, I'm overwhelmed by the number of people that are, that are, sewing masks, that are sewing uh, gowns, that are uh, bringing coffee to and, and food to physicians and to nurses and to healthcare workers, 
the, the amount of, of acts of kindness that we're seeing are, is just overwhelming. I think we're also uh, seeing what the benefits of science are. I mean, we discovered this disease late December. The virus was, was described early January. We now have tests, we have a vaccine, we have, several, we have 70 vaccines being tried, three of them already in clinical trials in humans. We have multiple medications being tested. So science has really accelerated the way in which we can respond to this disease. Otherwise, you think without science, where would we, we be now? And, and I see as an enormous uh, glimmer of hope the amount of, of international solidarity and uh, of, of collaboration that we're seeing uh, across scientists, across communities, across the country. I mean, to have people, you know, go to New York to help out there, to have people, you know, uh, nurses in, in California willing to go, that they're not busy enough, willing to go to New York to help out. So the amount of solidarity and the amount of of, of, of kindness that I'm, we're seeing, to me, are, are glimmers of, of, of who we really are and the humanity that actually is, is what, what we all live for. it will change us in profound ways. I think like many of us, I've begun to realize that my personal relationships, the people I love, the people I care about, the people I work with are far more important to me and far more integral to who I am than I had ever realized before. People have been using the word social distancing um, through this pandemic right now, I think that's a misnomer. I don't believe we should be socially distancing at all. We have to physically distance. That's what we have to do while we socially connect. of the bells will have a special place in um, our collective memory. You can hear them uh, as I speak. personal protective uh, donations and things like this um, bell ringing from the university indicating support for the team. All of those are ways to acknowledge uh, what, when you're in the moment, is a very, very intense experience. Caring for these patients is quite intense. One of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves and our children will be to commit more resources, far more resources, to developing strategies for being ready for the next one of these pandemics. So that when, again, we are forced to confront something like this, we won't be scrambling as a society, as individuals, as a culture, we'll be better prepared to meet it head on.